All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jonathan Chittenden, and uh, today we're going to cover um, some of the Amazon Web Services, um, some of their security mechanisms, and um, you know, just also look at some of their common pitfalls in either uh, their configuration or even in their implementation. Um, and then we'll also look at you know how you can leverage some of these um, security mechanisms for um, you know defense in depth within your application. Uh, and then you know the final piece of the puzzle, I guess, would be um, we'll talk about Scout AWS Scout, which is a tool that you can use to leverage um, you know some of these security mechanisms and just really look at you know assess um, you know easily assess you know your EC2 environment. So uh, you know first. Um, a quick in introduction. I know I don't have a bio, and that's uh, my fault, so I apologize for that. But um, I'm originally from San Antonio. Um, I went to school in UTSA, and I actually ran into one of my classmates here. I used to be a professional gamer, and so this is me at a uh, tournament, right? A professional gamer. What is that, right? Um, so I spent a lot of time playing games, and then I soon realized, hey, I need to get a job. So at UTSA, I focused in forensics, incident response, and um, also reverse engineering. Around this time, I uh, actually landed an internship with the Air Force at Lackland Air Force Base. And I did uh, malware analysis. Um, and then I also did some defensive programming. So that was a great opportunity. I met a lot of really great people and um, you know, really got me uh, started in security. Uh, then I pursued my undergraduate at uh, Polytechnic. Um, and then I graduated from there, got into application security. So now I live in New York, and I work for ISEC Partners. So that's kind of like the you know, past 10 years of my life. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, let's really just kind of get a high overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so one of my first projects working for ISEC was to uh, you know, assess um, an application stack for a client that involved a lot of, uh, um, the Amazon, uh, a lot of Amazon Web Services. And here we have three. Uh, these are by no means you know, all of the Amazon Web Services. You know, there's like 20 or 30. Um, but some of them don't even provide any attack surface, so they're really not entirely interesting. Um, so really, I just focused on EC2, S3, and uh, part of S3 incorporates uh, IAM. Um, so you know, the, the client had you know, a ton of questions for us. You, you know, this was like a new process for them you know, before they, ha they hosted locally you know, all their uh, web production servers, their staging, their dev environment. And now they were pushing all of this out into EC2. And so they weren't entirely sure if they were even um, correctly implementing the security features that AWS provides. So um, you know, this was pretty new to me as well. I spent a lot of time poring over uh, documentation. And I ended up writing a couple of scripts to just help automate this process, you know, some of the tasks that I had. And that was really the first breath, if you will, of Scout itself. Um, so, with that out of the way, you know, let's talk about, uh, oh, and before I begin, uh, uh, right, so it's alphabet soup, right? Um, there's a lot of acronyms out there. I'm going to be throwing them around. I'm going to do my best to like, clarify what they actually are. But at any point you have a question where I'm not entirely clear, or I begin mumbling or something, uh, feel free to stop me, ask me a question. Uh, if not, you, know, you can just uh, come up here after the talk and uh, ask me something privately if you need to. Um, but again, let's talk about uh, EC2 now. So uh, right, EC2 is by far the most popular uh, service, right? And it's pretty straightforward how you how you uh, use it. Um, at its most basic, <clears throat> excuse me. At its most basic level, uh, what it does is it allows you to rent a virtual machine on Amazon uh, uh, resources or actual their physically or their physical hardware. And there's uh, four four steps. So if you want to spin up an instance pretty quickly. You select your AMI, which is the Amazon mach machine image. And this is more or less your, uh, your operating system. So Ubuntu, uh, Windows Server, um, you know, Red Hat, you know, whatever it may be. Then you specify some instance details like, OK, what zone do I want it to be in? Asia Pacific, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Europe. And then you also specify which kernel. Um, and obviously, when you specify which kernel you want to use, uh, it needs to be a kernel that ideally has all the latest and greatest security patches. Um, that said, I'm pretty sure Amazon does a pretty good job of taking care of that. And then you select your key pair, or you generate a new key pair. And this allows you to remotely connect to your instance and uh, configure it if you need to or, or administer it. Uh, and then the last step, and this is really the bread and butter, is, uh, in my opinion, is the security groups. Um, and security groups are essentially 
uh, firewall rules that dictate what traffic can um, be sent to your instance. So starting at the top, we have uh, the AMI. And there's actually been a lot of security research here. Um, and so I'm not really going to get into some of the nitty gritty specifics, but I'll say this. Um, when you're going to share your AMI with the community, do your due diligence in actually removing, uh, you know, you're cleaning out your bash history, for example. You may have stored passwords in there. Uh, removing certificates um, or even, you know, keys that may be in your, um, you know, your SSH authorized key list. Uh, so some of the research that I've seen says that 30% of the community AMIs actually have, um, you know, passwords or other certificates in there. And that's an alarming number. I mean, that's a pretty large minority, right? Um, Alternatively, if you're going to use a community AMI, again, you need to check for SSH authorized keys because if I share an AMI and I put my SSH authorized key, maybe I just have something that beacons out to my server and then lo and behold, I know uh, that you just spun up my AMI and now I can remotely connect to it. So, you know, these are all real security, security problems. Um, a good rule of thumb is just to use um, Amazon's AMIs and then you'll be fine. You know, you don't really need to use the community AMIs for your web production server. Uh, so the next part of this is the EC2 key pair. And this, in my opinion, should be pretty obvious. But if you're going to use a single key for all your development team, uh, why? Like, honestly, ask yourself that. Instead, you should have a unique key, a key tied to each user um, for your instances. And so if you have employee turnover or a key gets compromised on their uh, laptop, maybe it gets stolen or something. Uh, you can simply just automatically uh, write up a script that will like, uh, delete their, their key and then give them a new one. Uh, and so now, finally, we've come to uh, the security groups. And again, I mentioned that essentially uh, they dictate what rules um, and what traffic can be delivered to your instance. Uh, and so I have an example here. Um, does anybody want to like, take a shot at this? This is from the Amazon CLI interface, the command line interface. Um, it's a little cryptic if you are looking at it for the first time, but maybe someone here has had some experience with it. Um, does anybody want to take a crack at it? Oh. All right. Oh, wow. uh, no, go no, ahead. No, no, no. All right, someone. Uh, allows uh, web traffic from anywhere. Exactly. Ingress. So, right. It's very basic. Um, I'll, I'll, I break it up into four parts. The first part is simply just the security group name. So it's web servers here. Over here, the SG is just the security group identifier. Uh, the, the second part is uh, the protocol. So it can be TCP, UDP, or ICMP. Uh, one of the interesting things about the security groups is that this is happening uh, before traffic is even being routed, right? Like this is happening at uh, Amazon's networking layer. These are permissions that uh, they're, they're routing. Uh, Amazon is actually routing the traffic. So even if you had like uh, an application fire, or rather a host-based firewall, uh, this traffic, if this is all you had, uh, you know, it's kind of redundant to have a host-based firewall. Uh, and then the third part is uh, the to and from port. So this is the to port, and this is the from port. Uh, it could just as easily be 80 to uh, 81, and that would open up two ports, right? That's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then the second part is uh, the source. So here it's a CIDR notated IP, 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, and as the gentleman in the back mentioned, uh, it's the entire internet. So as you would guess, is, this is a pretty standard uh, security group. But where can things go wrong here? Well, it turns out um, they can go wrong. And this is a security bulletin that Amazon released um, following some black hat research by a group called uh, SensePost. And what they showed, uh, basically they tore apart Memcache. Uh, Memcached is used as a memory, uh, distributed memory caching system. Uh, it's very popular in uh, you know, cloud environments, and it's also uh, pretty common in EC2 environments. Uh, so what they showed is you can anonymously and remotely uh, hit the Memcached server and read and write to it, which is pretty alarming because if you think about your, your you know, standard network uh, segmentation, your Memcached server should not be on your perimeter at all. It should be tucked away. Um, within your network. It shouldn't be uh, exposed to the internet. But lo and behold, uh, SensePost released a tool that went around and crawled um, EC2 uh, IP ranges looking for exposed memcached instances. So that's pretty alarming. It's so alarming that, you know, again, Amazon had to release this. So how do you manage this? Well, uh, you manage it through the security groups, right? Like I said, you would just apply a security group that set would block 
um, you know, traffic on port uh, 11211. Um, but again, yeah, it's not that clear cut because what once you know you used to have a network diagram, a network diagram that was uh, you know clear cut. You know, you could see you had an actual physical um, physical separation between your servers and your routers. Uh, now it's just all up in the cloud, and it's just kind of this ambiguous blob. You don't really know what's what. Um, and so, you know, at, you know, in my, my uh, field as a consultant, um, oftentimes I feel like lesser from the wire. Uh, you know, all these pieces matter. And why they matter is because now you really do have your production, your staging, your development, your management, uh, your database servers. They're all living pretty close to each other. And are, are they segmented to the exact same way that, uh, you know, your traditional network layouts uh, used to be? So how do you figure this out? How do you piece it together? Um, enter Scout. So Scout is a, a, a tool that a colleague and I began this earlier this summer. Um, we kind of demoed it a little bit at Arsenal at Black Hat. Um, and uh, it was a great experience. We really weren't too sure if people would be interested in something like this. Um, but that said, uh, we wrote it in Clojure using the Java library. And um, you know, basically, at its most basic level, it'll help you um, audit your EC2 environment. Um, so it's available in Git. Uh, this is the ISEC Partners Git, so you could hop on there, download the source, uh, make changes. Uh, it does, I, uh, buyer be warned, uh, it does have some bugs in it. We are aware of that. This was just an early prototype. Um, we're actually in the process of rewriting it entirely in Java. Um, question? Um, so the new version, it will dump out BPC. Um, but in the current version, uh, no, unfortunately it doesn't. Um, so I really won't be demoing the tool today because it really doesn't have any cool graphical output and I don't want to bore you guys with you know just huge blobs of text. Really it looks like in-map output which you know is pretty straightforward. Um, but, so that said I will talk about some of its functionality and give you some samples of what it'll look like. Um, so at its most basic level we wanted to help enhance manual analysis and the way that we wanted to perform this was uh, listing instances and in their security groups, and then listing security groups and their instances. Uh, so here's a quick example. If you're just interested in the web server instance, you can dump all the security groups related to that. So production, staging, RDP. You know, if you were looking at this, you might question why is RDP um, applied to our web server? Uh, that's really not necessary, especially for a production web server. And so, you know, if you saw this uh, manual output, you could go and say, okay, I need to look at this a little bit further. Uh, similarly, you may want to dump out a uh, security group itself and say, okay, I want to know all the security group, all the instances that have this RDP security group applied to. Uh, so you see like a jump server and a web server. Um, the jump server, just out of curiosity, does anybody know what a jump server is? Okay, great. Um, so basically it's just a, a server that you would connect to to remotely administer your, the rest of your instances. Question? Yeah. Can you compare Scout to Elastic? Um, elastic detector. So my understanding about, and correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially what it does is it periodically pings your EC2 instances and checks to see if anything's been spun up while uh, I guess you were away, right? Yeah, it's one of the things you do. Yeah. Exchange, power up, a group change, whatever. It's just running the command line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually haven't used the tool much. I am familiar with it though. Um, the, the kind of the idea between the two is a little bit different. This is more or less to help you, uh, you know, do you know some analysis. That's, in my opinion, more to detect uh, nefarious things going on with your AWS account. But I mean, I might, might be wrong. Again, I haven't used it. Uh, Can you repeat what the name of the tool was? Just uh, detector. Yeah. Okay. Free. Uh, Yeah, so it's ideal for detecting if people are, maybe you're asleep and they're spinning up instances and running up your uh, EC2 bill without you knowing, basically. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty cool uh, idea. Yeah, and it actually came out pretty recently, I believe. So it's a, it's a pretty new tool. Um, so right, uh, automated analysis. So one thing we wanted to do was just audit groups and highlight potentially uh, dangerous uh, ingress permissions. Oftentimes, 
developers will add things unknowingly and then just leave it there where you might have a consultant like myself come in and require uh, you know access to you know your production and um, you you'll grant me access and then you'll just forget about it right uh, so the idea here is um, based on port ratings and based on the source um, we'll give you some sort of uh, magic value uh, so the port ratings you provided a config file it's just simply a, a JSON and it'll say uh, one through five um, and then you just specify ports that you want to rate at uh, that level. Uh, one being the lowest, five being the highest. So one, for example, might be 80 or 443. Things that are pretty common um, for your EC2 instances. Uh, something that might be high would be like memcache, right? Or uh, RDP or, any, or maybe even SMTP, depending on how you use it. Uh, and then the source, uh, you know, if it's exposed to the entire internet, it's going to be rated higher than something that's just exposed to a single IP. So for example, a security group with 3389 open to the entire internet is going to be ranked higher than something open to uh, 3389 to a very specific IP, a single IP. Uh, and so also what it'll do is it'll give you, uh, you know, let's say critical finding, warning, or even just informational. Um, and so critical are obviously things that you need to go and check out uh, immediately. <laughs> um, and then finally, compare groups. Uh, so you want to compare known good with reality. So what you can do is provide uh, Scout with additional information, perhaps like a pristine configuration. Maybe when, when you first rolled out your EC2 instances, uh, this is what it should have looked like. And then Scout will compare that with reality, diff the two, and then say, this is what's uh, wrong or this is what's uh, really out there. Um, actually, one of the new things that we want to add is the ability to take snapshots of your environment, sort of like how maybe uh, EC2 detector does. But you would take maybe Q1, Q2, Q3, and then just see, uh, diff them, and just see how your, uh, your EC2 environment has grown, how it's changed over time. Um, all right, so now we'll change gears. Do we have a question? Right. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and so the way we do that in Scout um, is you just provided a config file. And uh, in there, ideally what you should do is just create a uh, special user that just has access to read rather than actually make changes. But, um, yeah, right, so then you would just provide the... Uh, yeah, I think it'll give yourself so much further. You think we do? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, that's a valid criticism. Um, all right, so changing gears, let's look at S3 now. Simply put, um, you put an object in a bucket, and that's really it. Um, so your object could be <laughs> your object could be um, really anything. It could be an MP3, it could be a photo, it could be uh, you know PDFs, whatever. And you put it in the bucket. Uh, and the bucket, you can just think of it as a, you know like a folder or something. It's just a container for all your, all your objects, and you can access it through a number of different interfaces. Um, so like, how would you use it? It's got a, a bunch of different uses. Uh, you know, if you have a mobile application and you do uh, photo uploading, right? Uh, you may want to use the REST uh, API. Uh, or if you do uh, file sharing or maybe uh, downloadable media and you want to save on uh, bandwidth, you might use uh, the BitTorrent interface. <clears throat> and obviously, both of these have like, completely different security requirements as far as you know, what you want to expose and how you want to enforce uh, access controls. So access controls, there's three different ways in uh, uh, S3, uh, ACL's bucket policy and the IAM policy. Um, and these work in completely different ways. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they basically accomplish the same job, but you would use them in very different use cases. Uh, and then you can also, in S3, do access logs, which is great if you want to look at metrics and see you know, what's been downloaded the most. Uh, most number of times, what's eating up all my bandwidth, or even if you have an incident that you need to respond to, maybe S3, uh, your HR bucket was exposed for a period of time and you can see what actually got accessed. Um, and then the final piece is uh, encryption, where you do uh, client-side and server-side encryption. Again, these are uh, very different and you need to make sure that you're using the right tool for the right job. So let's start at the top and look at the ACLs. Uh, the ACLs are, uh, I like to liken them to uh, like a blunt instrument because uh, you either do a read or write, or uh, rather, uh, you also have read and write ACP, but uh, that stands for access control policy, um, and we'll come back to that shortly. 
but you either do a read or a write or you get full control. Um, and then you also have your grantee, which could be an AWS account, so an authenticated user to AWS. Uh, and then you have you know, a predefined group also, so authenticated users, all users, and uh, log delivery, which would be for um, you know, uh, your access log. All users, again, would be anonymous, so anybody could access uh, that obje object or bucket. And so I have a, an example of a permission here that's pretty straightforward. Mm. It says grant all users permission to read to public photos. Uh, so if you wanted to do this in S3, you would do this through XML, but this is just, you know, just a proof of concept. Um, and this makes sense, right? So if you have a, uh, you know, a mobile application that, um, you know, you share photos and you want to be able to say, okay, everything in this bucket we share. Um, so we have Woody here and he takes all these awesome pictures of food and then he shares them. Um, right, so this is great for ACLs because uh, you have a lot of objects in a single bucket, right? Um, and this will make sense again shortly. Uh, so, you know, changing gears and looking at the bucket policy, uh, this is a very precise instrument. And the reason why is because you can get very, um, very, uh, uh, very fine grained uh, permissions. So, uh, for instance, here we have um, this is the action, and then this is uh, if conditional right here. Um, so, what you can do with that is you can get very specific and say, Anybody can get this object uh, through the torrent, through the torrent interface uh, on this bucket if the time is between today at 3 and today at 4. Um, and some other cool things that you can do is you can say, okay, I want to say, have a condition that says, um, you know, make sure that any object that's uploaded to this bucket is encrypted server side or make sure that any time there's a read or a write to this bucket, it goes over uh, secure transport, so HTTPS, um, or even something as simple as, um, allow read or write access only from this specific IP address. Um, and so the, the way that this works is it doesn't use um, XML, it instead, instead uses the JSON access policy language, which is um, kind of confusing if you first look at it. Uh, it's so confusing that Amazon ended up releasing this policy generator that um, you basically point and click and it'll just generate uh, the policy for you. So. Right, if you're a record company, this permission might actually make sense because say um, Justin Bieber releases a new song and you wanna make sure that only people can access it between three and four. And so, you know, it's, maybe it's a preview release or a preview track or something similar. Um, and it gives you that fine grain control. Um, and then the final piece uh, of the access controls is the uh, IAM policy. And this is your fine grained uh, permission model uh, again, you do this through the JSON uh, policy language, but um, the weird thing is, is uh, you create an IAM principle, so a user or a group, and then you attach IAM policies to it. Now at this point, your eyes might be glazing over and you're like, what did he just say to me? <laughs> um, now, so just bear with me, I'll actually break down uh, what IAM is. So it's identity access management, and it allows you to create uh, users and groups that have access to your um, your EC2 resources or your S3 resources or any, any of your other um, AWS resources. So for instance, you might want to create a user that has privileged access to your EC2 environment. That means uh, he can uh, spin up you know, new instances, take down instances, uh, modify details if you want. And then you might have a lesser privileged user that maybe can only um, you know, simply uh, you know, read the details for certain instances. Uh, and you can also do this for S3, right? So you can say, uh, I have a privileged account that can modify S3 buckets, delete them, so on and so forth. It also allows for identity federation. And this is great because um, it will sync up with your Active Directory, and so you don't actually have to create users yourself. <coughs> Instead, it'll just use the users and groups um, that you already have in your Active Directory. Um, so for instance, Maybe you have a bunch of different departments and you're gonna move all your organizational infrastructure into uh, Amazon's uh, web services. So EC2, you're gonna use their buckets, you're just gonna use everything. Uh, and you wanna have your HR, uh, you have an HR group, you have your sales group, you have your marketing group. Um, and you have just different buckets and resources for all these different departments. Well, the beauty of it is you can just simply use your uh, already pre-existing Active Directory and just simply uh, create policies and attach them to these groups. And then that way you can ensure that you know, 
the, the various departments only have access to the resources that you've uh, permitted them to. So how, do they, how should you use these? Um, so tying it all together, ACLs again, uh, they scale very well. Like you can use them for you know, hundreds and thousands of objects within a bucket. Your bucket policy actually has a limit. It has a limit of 20 kilobytes. And so you can't really, um, you can't use it on uh, you know, a mass scale like you can the ACLs. Um, also, the ACLs obviously have limited functionality. You can only do simple reads and writes. Whereas your bucket policy you can specify um, exact uh, details that you want to enforce. Um, and so I find that the bucket policies are great if you want to incorporate more uh, defense in depth when, within your application. You can enforce HTTPS if you have uh, HIPAA compliancy. And, um, or you can also enforce uh, that you, know, you, can, you can check a box off to say that everything in our S3 environment is encrypted with server-side encryption. Um, so there's a number of things that you can enforce there. And again, the IAM policy um, <coughs> allows you to just do uh, <coughs> identity federation. You didn't see any. OK, so um, right. So essentially, what you can do is, uh, sorry, there's a gnat flying at my face. Um, right, so you can have your Active Directory server, and you can have uh, like specific users and groups, and you won't have to create them within, uh, within IAM. Instead, um, you just use whatever Active Directory has, and you can attach policies to those users and groups. Um, I don't know for certain. Um, maybe that's something that we can sit down and look at, uh, you know, after this. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure if they support LDAP. Um, whether or not LDAP. Um, all right. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, so out of curiosity. Um, well, actually, let's look at how S3 actually evaluates all these different ACLs that you can create. And what it uses is uh, something that I think is pretty neat, and it's just called default deny logic. Uh, so by default, everything is denied. Uh, when a request comes in, um, it says, all right, I'm going to deny this. It's going to evaluate all the policies. And then it'll say, is there an explicit deny? If there is, then it's just going to say, uh, I'm going to deny this uh, uh, request. Otherwise, it'll check to see if there's an explicit allow. If there is, then it will actually allow the request. Otherwise, it denies. Um, sorry about that. Um, so one of the interesting things, though, is if, if you have a policy that says uh, maybe you have an ACL that permits access and you have a bucket policy that denies access, um, the deny is always going to trump uh, the permit. So um, again, right here, you, know, you could have multiple pol policies that contradict each other, but the end result will always be denied. And the beauty of that really is that by default, it's going to be secure unless you, uh, you know, you know, accidentally mess things up. <laughs> um, so uh, now we're we're in the realm of uh, encryption now, and so looking at the server-side encryption, this is great because Amazon manages all the keys for you. They'll generate the keys, uh, and then they they'll also encrypt all of the objects that you specify need to be encrypted. So that basically means you can transfer the risk to Amazon. Um, you don't have to bear any of that risk. Uh, you don't have to manage the keys. And this is great, especially if, um, you know, if you have certain compliancy that says that you know, all objects need to be uh, encrypted, you can do it quite simply through the server-side encryption. I have a question. Yeah. I'm fairly certain it is. Uh, I know Amazon, um, I'm pretty sure that that's something they've worked in. Uh, into their, you know, FIPS compliancy. Um, I don't know about FIPS entirely too much, but I imagine 256 bit is probably, yeah. I mean, it would take, uh, yeah. I mean, I can't imagine that being cracked anytime soon. Um, right. So the next part of this is uh, the client side encryption. So for the client side encryption, essentially, right, you take ownership of the keys. Um, but the cool thing that AWS does is they have this SDK that can uh, help you make this process much easier. And they use something that's called envelope encryption. Um, out of curiosity, how many people are actually familiar with uh, the concept of envelope encryption? OK. So um, this was actually something that was pretty new to me as well. 
Um, we have like maybe three hands, and I was uh, surprised. So essentially, what you have is uh, you have your blob of data. Uh, the SDK will generate a one-time key, and you encrypt that blob of data, and then you encrypt the one-time key with your master key. So the only way you can obtain the one-time key, right, is obviously you have to have the master key. Um, and the, the beauty of this is uh, if the master key is ever compromised, you don't have to go through and re-encrypt all the uh, blobs of data. All you have to do is just re-encrypt the one-time key. And so you don't have to spend uh, resources or time or effort to encrypting all that. You just simply en encrypt the uh, one-time key. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> The master key? Yeah. So for client side, uh, you actually, that's something that you provide. Uh, the one-time key is something that the SDK will generate and use, and then you just provide the uh, master key. So right, like in client side, um, actually back up. So right, so for uh, client side, right, um, you provide the key. You have to uh, make sure that you're securely storing it and that, you know, it's, uh, you know, not, it doesn't become compromised too easily. Um, it, you know, looking at these two, there's actually, uh, you know, some different use cases I mentioned. Um, and let me actually circle back. So uh, for the client side encryption, this is, um, you have to be very careful about where you use this. Because if you're developing a mobile application that uploads uh, photos um, or, you know, maybe some blob of data that you want to encrypt and then send up to S3, um, that's a cause for concern. You should pause because that means the key uh, must reside on the mobile application somewhere, right? And we all know the mobile application or the mobile environment isn't the most secure environment. It's actually, you should consider it as a hostile environment. Um, and so if you're storing that key on there, uh, obviously that's a cause for concern. Instead, you should look at something like the server side encryption. Uh, but again, you may also run into situations where you, know, um, you can't do server side encryption for whatever reason because you know, maybe you have some uh, obligation to uh, not share private keys with third parties. Um, right, so looking at Scout and how it uses S3, I'll be blunt, it's very crude. And the reason why is because looking at ACLs, I had mentioned the uh, access control policy. Uh, unfortunately, that actually costs money to pull down. Um, it costs about, uh, and it's not much, but it's one cent per 10,000 requests. Um, and so when we were writing Scout, uh, really we paused and we were said, okay, well we can't really just pass that on to the, uh, the users. Of, or the operators of Scout, mostly because um, maybe people don't realize how many objects they have up there, and if all of a sudden they incur, you know, $100 in their bill, and it's because of us, um, we would feel pretty, uh, I guess, shitty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then we uh, looked at the IAM policies, and to be honest, they're really not too interesting because chances are you're already aware of them already. Um, these are all things that you probably added yourself. Um, one thing that we could do there is maybe have you provide additional information and then we can diff and try to highlight certain issues. But again, these are uh, policies that you already set in place. Um, and so it's really not too interesting. Um, we are considering coming back to that though. So what we do is we look at bucket policies. And uh, currently all we do is we just dump out every bucket or object that has anonymous uh, access due to a bucket policy. And like I said, it's very crude. Um, but you know, there are some other, other things that we want to grow into, like if you have certain uh, objects and bu uh, buckets that you know that should be encrypted, you can say, scout, uh, go through these and make sure they're all encrypted. <clears throat> so um, at this point, um, here I have some resources. So if you guys want to check these out, um, I referenced uh, the, uh, the AMI research. Uh, this gentleman right here, he works for Dell. Um, and he actually uh, released this. It's actually a pretty cool read. Um, and yeah, so at this point, if you guys have any questions or uh, you want to, you know, reach out and uh, you know tell me anything about this presentation or you know have some suggestions for Scout, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, and at this point, if you guys have any additional questions, yes. I got one for you. I kind of got you. Uh, EC2, the Amazon Master Console. If you know anything about the Amazon Master Console, is before you do anything where you set up S3 and EC2, you have the option of enabling two-factor authentication, which lets you use Google Authenticator and phone. Now, there's a gotcha here, because on the root account, um, when it asks you to do that, it asks you to take a picture of the barcode with your phone, and then you do that and accept it and hit OK, only that person who took a picture at that moment in time can get into your master console. 
So if you want some sort of failover on that, you've got to line everybody up. They all have to take a picture of the phone. And then you have to take into account what happens if everybody rotates their phones. This is your master root account, so this is your God account. It's easy for users because the, the root account can go change or disable the users and you can rotate those to your heart's desire. The root account, yeah. recovering that is impossible, so you have to really think about it. Take a picture of the screen, print it, keep it in a key repository, uh, you know, line up 10 people with their phones. Uh, but if you do what we did in early on MDM and replace everybody's phone, you have to realize you just lost all your master keys. So, uh, so, so how you might Yeah, no, that's actually a very interesting Yeah, you might want to add it to Brezzo because yeah. uh, that can be paid. Well, how we deal with that, it's actually pretty simple. You just buy a hardware MFA device for 15 bucks. Yeah, well, hard to do that. <laughs> you lock it away and create IAM accounts for everybody. Nobody ever has to use that account. That's the idea. Like if you, know, that, you should never use that account. Be surprised when and they do have an API for the for your instances you want to use. Yeah, just to add to what uh, you have said for the multi-factor authentication. So um, if your US has the multi-factor authentication mm. for logging into the console, so you basically get a code. And then recently, I think in the past uh, few months, uh, mm. they announced the uh, AMF protected uh, API. For example, uh, you talk about the policy yeah. uh, with EC2, so you can set up the policy so that certain critical operations is fine uh, granularity control. Right. Uh, for example, to shut down a virtual machine, you have to have multi-factor authentication in order to shut down a virtual machine. Oh, Otherwise, cool. other people get your key. Just yeah. shut down your machine completely shut down <laughs> right. your business. So you can actually specify the policy of yeah. the API, specific API. That's actually really good insight. Like, yeah, you can add it to your scoring engine, and you can easily check if uh, MFA is not going to be using policies mm -hmm. and policies. In policies, you might have a condition yeah. which will tell you if you should tell you that you are allowed to be authenticated on this piece of MFA. Okay. So yeah, that's, uh, thank you. That's actually really great. Um, do we have any other questions? I just have a general question about the uh, Can they host all of their own services on the site, or is it something that makes up uh, I don't know about that. I, I don't work for Amazon. Um, yeah, I don't even know if they actually release those kind of details. I'm sure it's pretty guarded. Um, yes? So, I mean, what have you found from running this? The, the most of the things you see, are they user implementation issues, or are they just when you generate a brand new one, it's generated in an insecure state? Um, oftentimes, what you see is actually just like misconfiguration or misunderstandings in their implementation. So yeah, I mean that's really what uh, Scout is really good at identifying. Well, when you when you power up an EC2 instance, when you're configuring it initially, it gives you two options to configure it. If you select the wrong option, you just gave the world access to your instance. Yeah. So you have to pay real close attention when you're powering this stuff up. Yeah. And then if you're using one of these community AMIs, like he just pointed out, who knows what's on that AMI, right? And there's a whole bunch of those available to you. Elastic detectors, one of them. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and um, you know I, I failed to mention this, but uh, so ISEC is actually having a party at a Six Lounge rooftop. Um, so I'm sure it's like open bar. If you guys are interested, we have invites here. You guys are more than welcome to come. Uh, and if you guys have additional questions or suggestions, I would love to uh, hear it and talk to you. Um, yes, sir. Can we just uh, slide uh, email you? Or? Um, yeah, preferably. Um, actually, I am going to get the slides. Uh, am I supposed to trust this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hold on, hold on. I got my own. I got my own. Yeah, that's true. I could easily do that. How about, I'll, I'll give you this. How about that? You trust me. All right, security consultant. But again, uh, thanks for coming out, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, and I hope you enjoy Austin. Thank you. All right.